Blessings, everyone. Thank you for joining me. And today, uh, it's a special day. I have uh, Father Joshua Gainig from uh, Michigan, right, Father? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I have a I have a a, a short uh, biography for Father Joshua that I got off the the uh, the par his parish website, and it says uh, Father Joshua Gainig. Uh, received his BA in religious studies from Concordia University Ann Arbor, and his M. Div. Is that what masters? Uh, what is that, Father? Master M Master of Divinity. It's kind of the common seminary degree. Okay, in yeah. theology from Concordia Theological Seminary Fort Wayne, and his PhD. Wow, in syn systematic theology from the University of Saint Andrews, UK. Where's that, Father? Uh, St. Andrew, Scotland. Wow. Okay. Yeah, the big the big golf course, you know, the old course. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Golf was invented right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he carries out secular employment as a staff chaplain at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor. You still doing that, Father? I was until Holy Week. Oh, so okay. I, yeah, yeah. In fact, we could talk about that a little bit today. Okay. But I did that for several years. Yeah. Wow. Before coming into the Orthodox Church, Father Joshua served as a Lutheran minister, LCMS. What does that stand for? Luth so that stands for Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And associate professor of theology at two Roman Catholic seminaries. That's interesting. Yeah. He has yeah. authored several academic monographs, articles, and papers. Father Joshua is married to Matushka Abigail Barbara, a middle school English teacher. Wow. And they are blessed with six daughters six. six yeah they're a noisy bunch i said i need an hour and a half you all they're out shopping and going to the pool today so i said oh what yeah. are their age ranges father everybody asks me what their exact ages are and i always give the oldest and the youngest That's, I yeah. remember them all in the middle my oldest no. just turned 18 oh wow and my youngest will be three in august so you wow you got teenager to like yes. little kid Absolutely. Although the greatest blessing that happened to my family was my oldest getting her driver's license. Oh, I bet that Game helps. Changer. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, now, Father, I wanted to learn. I bet that I, I probably want to talk to, mostly to Father about conversion to orthodoxy and converts because I thought, well, he's a good example because he's a convert himself. Yeah. Um, now, were you raised... Um, a Lutheran father? I was, yeah. In fact, uh, in a very pretty devout Lutheran family, you would ask what LCMS stood for. Yeah. And that that particular denomination is, I would say, probably the more or most or very close to the most conservative of all of the Lutheran traditions. Okay. And I don't mean socially conservative, though there is a part of that, but really theologically pretty conservative. Okay. So what does that look like? For example, they did not ordain women in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Um, they had a pretty strong stance about human sexuality and the nature of the human person. So I was born and raised into a Missouri Synod Lutheran family. My dad was a Lutheran school teacher. He became a Lutheran school principal. I mean, we were kind of, the joke was blue-blooded Lutherans, family from Eastern Europe, um, and, and much of my family, including my own parents, are still Missouri Synod Lutherans to this day. So I was born and raised in the Lutheran Church and went off to Lutheran University in Ann Arbor, Concordia, with every intention of being a Lutheran pastor, Lutheran minister, which is what I eventually ended up doing um, until, I, until I found Jesus, I would say. Now, are the, the, the Lutherans that you were involved with, are they involved with are they sort of comparable to like the southern baptists i would say in terms of their conservatism yeah. yes although okay. in terms of kind of liturgical theology sacramental theology they're far closer i would say to kind of old roman catholics wow you know you get a you get some variation there's not continuity across the board but at least the parishes i served i served two lutheran churches one in Wheaton, Illinois, literally a golf ball shot from the Billy Graham Center, Wheaton College. Wow. Um, and there we had, you know, it was a parish of 1,800 parishioners. At one time, there was a large grade school there. 
And we were receiving converts to Lutheranism really from evangelicalism, people looking for something more traditional, mm. sacramental, liturgical. We also had converts from modern Roman Catholicism who oh. just said, the Roman Catholic Church is not what I grew up in. I want something more traditional. And they found it in Lutheranism, at least at that parish. The second church I served actually is in was in uh, Buckhead in Atlanta, Georgia, which I think at the time was the eighth or ninth wealthiest zip code in the United States. Uh -huh. And there you had more of kind of a Southern Baptist kind of contingent <clears throat> that eventually would come into Lutheranism. Um, and that was for them, that was sort of the extreme of liturgical and sacramental theology. Lutheranism was. So I was there for a very short period of time and then eventually um, left there, came back to Michigan where I'd grown up. And I can tell you that story too, but that's how we came into the Orthodox Church eventually. Yeah. How how was your experience in in getting your education? Did did you like it? I mean, did you enjoy all your studies and yeah. and and at different colleges and then going over to Scotland and very much so. Yeah. So I went, you know, I did, like I said, undergraduate work at Concordia, which is here in Ann Arbor, okay. in the same city as the University of Michigan, one of the most probably liberal and progressive universities in the world. You had this. Yeah, small, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. You had this small bastion of kind of good, solid, conservative, traditional kids huh. um, went there and, and knew I was going to go to seminary pretty quickly after that. In the Lutheran Church, there are two seminaries in the United States, one in St. Louis and one in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Mm. Not, not unlike, I think, orthodoxy, different approaches at different seminaries, not a ton of them in the United States. I went to what was considered probably the more traditional seminary. Um, and ironically, I went to a seminary with all male students and ended up meeting my wife there because my father-in-law is a division chair and was dean of the chapel and professor there. Wow. So I met my wife. I went to take summer Greek. You had to take a Greek class, pass a Greek entrance, entrance exam to get into seminary. You uh -huh. could do this in the fall or start early in the summer. I did it in the summer. There must have been a hundred other men trying to enter seminary with me. About two weeks in, I see this young woman on campus. I, of course, it's all men, right? And she's there for the summer working on campus in public relations before moving to New York to be a teacher. And we became friends and started dating. And about four months later, she had moved to New York. We got engaged. She moved back and we were married the following fall. So, yeah, so I, I loved my undergraduate education. I loved my seminary education. It was a very solid, I mean, a long, the, the MDiv program was longer than most Master of Divinity programs in the United States right now, about 120 credits. And I knew what I wanted to do was eventually teach theology in the Lutheran system. And to do that, you you get a PhD. And what was probably the best fit for me was to go and do a European style degree, which is heavily focused on writing a dissertation. And so uh, I actually began my studies at the University of Durham in England, which is where uh, Andrew Louth, Father Andrew Louth is a professor. Father Josiah Trenum did his PhD there. Really? Uh, who I know is out your way in California. Yeah. I was there for one year and my doctoral father was offered the oldest chair in theology at St. Andrews. Uh, it, this position is 500 years old. And he, he moved to St. Andrews and said, come with me and study there. So I finished my degree then at St. Andrews, commuting back and forth, as strange as that sounds. I was serving a church here in the United States. Oh. And every summer I go over for about six to eight weeks, depending on the year. I do all my work here in the States, communicate at this time. I don't think there was even Zoom, to be honest. Communicate uh, by phone. Uh-oh. Yeah, 2012, no. Yeah, or it was just getting started. But communicate by phone and written, you know, email and things like that. And then I go back to St. Andrews every summer for about eight weeks and meet, you know, daily with my doctoral father, work what? all day in the library. Was your wife over there with you? She was. Thank God. You know, at that time, the one yeah. blessing was to, when I started, we only had one child and she was under two. And so she was flying for free. So my wife would go, you know, it was basically by her ticket. And um, we always joked that those were some of the best days of our life because oh. I'd go study all day. She'd go to the markets in town and walk around and we'd meet at the pub at the end of the day for a beer. Oh. And oh. it was beautiful. Yeah. 
How fun. Now, now, now you were going to, so after you graduated, you were, I don't know how, what do you call it in, in Lutheran is you were going to be ordained a priest and then you were going to teach as well. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So at, at that time, once I finished that master's degree at the seminary, okay. I was actually ordained a Lutheran minister at that a min time. Minister, I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. No, 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 you're okay. okay. And I, that's when I went and began serving in Wheaton, Illinois. Okay. Concurrent with that, I was accepted into the PhD program. And the the regulations in most of those UK degrees, Cambridge, Oxford, Durham, St. Andrews, was that you had to be in residence a certain period of time out of the year, but not year round. So I was able to kind of go back and forth. Okay. And ultimately, the, the idea was that I would go and teach at the Lutheran seminary where I myself had studied. So during the time of your studies, you hadn't read something or come across something that maybe made you doubt Lutheranism at all? It's a great question. Yeah, I actually was thinking about our conversation today, wondering if you would ask, when did all of this start? Oh, well, of course. Yeah, okay, yeah. I, mean, I was going to get to that. But yeah, I thought right. maybe yeah. something that maybe you, you came across yeah. something that it seems like a lot of people that yeah. are deeply into study, sometimes they come across something like an like a church father or something. Or... Yeah, you know, I, I would say shortly after I was ordained a Lutheran minister, that was in 2006. So, you know, it had been now, it's almost 20 years since that time. But shortly after I was ordained a Lutheran minister, I began to really question, is my, is my Lutheran ordination in line with the apostolic succession of the church? What I mean by that is, hmm. is my ordination valid? You know, does this fall in line with the way God wanted people, men, to be ordained and the process or the mode by which he's done that for 2000 years. And so reading the church fathers, you could read St. John Chrysostom on the priesthood, you know, even, even St. Augustine, some of his homilies, reading those, you begin to see there is an order to how God makes priests. And I'm not in that. Hmm. And that, you know, for me, that caused a real crisis of conscience. Um, I, I jokingly tell people now, I don't ever lose sleep anymore over wondering if I'm a priest. I lose sleep over other things, but not that. But at the time, you know, Joseph, I'd, I'd be up many nights wondering, am I just playing church? Hmm. Which is ultimately why we had to leave. Hmm. Now yeah. you, uh, you, you, I, found, I found an old article you wrote it was called My Journey into the Orthodox Church. It was, I, I should, what I'll do is um, in the video description, I'll, I'll put the link if you don't mind. Yeah. No, that's great. You, yeah. It was from First Things. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember that article? I, I do very time. well. Yeah. I remember the reaction to it very well. <laughs> oh, it's good. I wanted to read, th this was kind of the part that struck yeah. me and I kind of wanted to read it to you because I, I kind of wanted you to maybe explain it a little bit. You use some uh, Latin terms in here. I think maybe I'll skip them. You know, okay. I can't pronounce it. What struck <laughs> me within weeks of my ordination was the reality that most parishes did not do church the way my parish did, not to mention some of the other theological and confessional aberrations and contradictions. And that was okay. Or so the sin had said. In fact, I was encouraged. Unity was important, or so it seemed, but only in the essentials. While some very good pastors supported the understanding that, uh, that was a Latin term, the general practice of the sinner conveyed a different reality. In short, it was left to every parish governed by the voters assembly to determine what it thought was best. In turn, some were liturgical. Others were not more liturgical than many Roman Catholic parishes. Still others were middle of the road and many were indistinguishable from the local charismatic Protestant parish. What this discontinuity signified, however, was a break in communion. We did not have all things in common. In fact, in many instances, we had very little in common. Yet even that was delineated by interpretation. I skipped the the, the 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 Latin terms 
people can go back and read it. What I thought was interesting about this, so it seems like you were saying that Lutheranism where you were was kind of, and correct me, it, yeah. it was kind of all over the place liturgically. This reminded me of my experience in it with Catholicism, especially mm -hmm. here in, in San Francisco, is mm -hmm. that, I mean, there's a couple of parishes that are very liturgically uh, traditional, like the Latin Mass yeah. and, and things like that. And then you've got ones that are very charismatic. Mm -hmm. and so that's all over the place. But then you also, because you mentioned uh, uh, things in here, uh, where was it? You know, you know, we're, we're kind of, churches did their own thing and you kind of see that in catholic churches because you have like uh, uh liturgical committees yes, yes which is always made up of lay people and they sort of determine how the liturgy is going to go and what songs and yeah. and everything so it's very protestant i thought yeah. my impression of catholicism it was just all over the place but then liturgically there's not any unity but then also theologically there isn't too like mm -hmm. just just on the issue that i know a lot about which is the the gay one mm -hmm. in san francisco you've got parishes that bless same-sex unions and then you've got ones that wouldn't do that so mm -hmm. it seems like that's kind of what you were saying am i correct that's exactly right and i don't okay. you know it's been it's been several then again almost 20 well let's see that was probably 2013 i wrote that article yeah so it's been several years, but I would say that, you know, there's that Latin phrase, I think what's in there, and it's been several years since I've read the article, is lex orande lex credendi. And and that is an old, old axiom. Yeah. That literally means lex being law, the law of prayer, or the law of prayer, lex orande, which think about this position, you know, with your hands, the orans position. Uh, yes. So the law of prayer is the law of belief, credendi, like creed. And so what that I'm going to I'm going to simplify what that means for anybody listening but essentially Please. it means this the way you pray is the way you will believe. Please. So if you pray like a Baptist, you'll believe like a Baptist. If you pray like a Roman Catholic, you'll believe like a Roman Catholic. But what that also means is if there is not continuity of prayer, meaning every church prays a little differently, uh -huh. there will not be continuity of belief. Mm. Because every church will believe it. So in my own context, and I think you're spot on about Catholicism, I learned that very quickly in leaving Lutheranism and exploring Catholicism. Oh, you did? I exact, didn't know that. It was the exact same problem. It was Lutheran. In fact, it was worse than Lutheranism in many respects. But what I found was we have this whole, all this talk about we're united as a Lutheran church, Missouri synod. But my church, you know, we... We we bought all of our vestments, no lie. We bought all of our vestments from Gamarelli in Rome. Mm. We flew to Rome. We were fitted by the Gamarelli family who makes the Pope's vestments. Well, that's hardcore. Yeah. I mean, it was we spent thirty thousand dollars on vestments. Oh. And and we came back and we were extraordinarily traditional. We heard confessions. We had daily mass. You know, we did all these things that would be really, you know, odd to a Protestant. But that's who we were as Lutherans. It'd be odd to some Catholics. Too. Be, exactly. Yes, exactly. And then we went, you know, you go two miles down the road to another Lutheran church within our same synod. So we're all in communion and they would have a praise band and a clown. And, and so the way you pray determines how you believe. And if, if that's true and the church is to be one, then what that means is you have to have unity and commonality and continuity in how you pray if you want to be one in your belief i didn't find that in catholicism i did not see that in lutheranism it's only present in the orthodox church so so the i don't know how to say it the group that you were with in lutheranism yeah. did you have like a reputation of being the traditional group yeah, the, or well the group itself was considered traditional but i think even within that group and there are about six thousand missouri synod lutheran churches across the country so it's not a small denomination within that group even the parishes i served were considered sort of hyper traditional so you were like yeah. the trads the, the precisely lutheran trads. yes without the social and moral issues <laughs> yes okay liturgically that's how it was okay
So when when you started questioning Lutheranism, was was one of the first uh, religions you looked at? Was it Roman Catholicism? It it very much was because I think I was under the deception that probably many are, which is I'm a Westerner, yeah. so I go to the to the Western Church, as it were. And and I will say, and this is one of the great deceptions of Catholicism, is that what you get in practice is not what you read in the catechism. No. And you know that. For, yeah, exactly. So, sure you know, not. yeah. So, you know, reading the catechism and saying, wow, this a lot of this makes logical sense. And then you walk into a church the the first the first experience we had, we had just moved back to Michigan. And when I was leaving the Lutheran church, of course, I was giving up a salary, a house, insurance. Oh. Oh. And thank God, and I really do mean this, thank God, I had just finished a PhD. And one of my, not friends, but acquaintances that I'd gotten to know through the years was the secretary to the Archbishop of Detroit, the Catholic Archbishop. And I was floundering. What are we going to do? You know, I, I'm leaving the Lutheran ministry, which means no Lutheran church is going to hire me, and I can't do that in good conscience. We're kind of thinking about Catholicism, and they hired me at a Catholic seminary to run one of their master's programs wow. and teach church history. Can now, I, looking can back, I, can, I yeah, yeah. can I ask where that was? Yeah, that was St. Cyril and Methodius, which was a okay. Roman Catholic seminary in Orchard Lake, Michigan. Okay. Um, it was not a diocesan seminary. It was a seminary that was, had a special kind of history of bringing seminarians over from Poland. They would do English language classes here and then go out and serve parishes in the United States. Um, but the the seminarians themselves, for the most part, were genuinely good men. They were very traditional men. They're from Poland, right? Yeah, you know, they're yeah. they tend to be far more traditional than American born. Wait. But at a at an institutional level, Joseph, it had all the problems you have identified in the Catholic Church today, if you know oh, what I mean. I do. Oh, so I'm so sorry. It was uh, yeah. Well, I know when you yeah. said Detroit, Detroit's had a lot of issues, just that area in the archdiocese in yes. the Catholic Church. Yes. So my 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 ears kind of yes, this hurt. this seminary was sort of protected because it was much smaller. It had I don't want to use the word charism, but kind of a special culture. You know, they brought men over, um, and really it kind of embraced the legacy of John Paul II because it was a Polish seminary. Yeah, yeah which now we're finding out was maybe not the most profitable legacy. No. Now, um, you weren't, no, you weren't Catholic. No. So we okay. actually, we left the Lutheran church. I was in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we left the Lutheran church, moved back to Michigan because I had received this job offer. Can I ask about that first? Because yeah, yeah. here you're, you've been raised in the Lutheran church. You married a lady whose yeah. who's family is very involved with the Lutheran church. Yes. Yes. And then you're leaving. Yeah. So that's that's so, kind of like me because I, I can kind of relate because I'm raised Italian Catholic. Yes. Yeah. So it's hard to leave because so, your whole yeah. family and everybody is involved in the church. Absolutely. There's a there's a cultural <laughs> connection. There's a familial connection. Yeah. There's a theological connection. It's what we yeah. know. Yep. Yeah. And and I think had my had my fam my my own family and my wife's family not been so deeply connected to the Missouri Synod, some families would say, "Hey, God bless you. Whatever you do, we don't care." Uh, I think I think it was a very difficult time for our family, our extended family. But even within the broader Lutheran circles, which I said I just told you, it's six thousand parishes, but it's really everybody knows everything about everyone, and. In that process, in leaving the parish, going to a Catholic seminary, what mm -hmm. began to be said was he's going to convert to Catholicism. And Lutherans have one goal, which is to despise Catholicism, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. So there was, you know, we received, I received handwritten letters saying, not exaggerating, we're praying for your death. Because wow. if you die now, you're not going to get entangled with the Catholic Church. That's right. You know, it was... A very difficult time, and a lot of, thank God, in his mercy, a lot of bridges have been mended over the years. But it took several years of people really, really treating us pretty poorly. And I, 
on the one hand, I can understand, right? People have deep seated roots in these places. Um, but it was a very difficult time. We felt very much alone and expecting we'll go to Michigan. We'll find a great Catholic parish. That's what we'll do. And the first service we ever went to uh, was at a small, you know, now they've combined all these churches, right? It was at a small uh, Roman Catholic service. And one of the auxiliary bishops was there. Mm. And the the last song was Lord of the Dance. <clears throat> processing out with his crozier and people are clapping. And I looked at my wife and said, no. this is this is a hundred times worse than our Lutheran church. Oh, totally. Just at a superficial level, why would we ever exchange that for this? Uh, and so it was it was clear at that moment that we could not be Roman Catholic. I mean, one one service in, one mass in, this is a mess. Just in terms of vestments, you're not going to find the beautiful vestments you were buying in Rome. No. Oh, we <laughs> bought we bought the polyester you know, the beautiful, stuff. And... Yeah, we had the beautiful Saint Philip Neri cut. You know, very very. You didn't find that anywhere. No, no, no. no. maybe at a traditional Latin mass. Yes. Did you ever? Did you ever seek out or find or go to the traditional Latin? We mass? didn't. Of course, I knew about it, and we had oh. one parish in town that would serve. Uh, a new mass but in latin mm -hmm. one saturday a month i knew the priest in part because i was teaching at the seminary where he served it was fine but again it was an anomaly yeah. you know there was it was a one-off at least in this area and at the end of the day it continued to reveal that continuity of prayer and continuity of belief it wasn't there no 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 before i interrupted you you were you were you were on your timeline that, that you were at the at the Roman Catholic Seminary, mm -hmm. but so during that time you were looking at Roman Catholicism, yeah. but then there must have came a time when you said, "No, I'm not absolutely going to do that." So yeah. then, what what do you do? Because for a lot of yeah. people, Roman Catholicism—I mean, for me, it was kind of like the last stop. I mean, what do you yes. do? What are you going to do? As a Westerner, I think, especially coming <laughs> well, out of a, a deeply exactly. Western, you know, a church that emerged or a denomination that emerged out of Roman Catholicism, yeah. it was sort of, oh, this is where you go, right? You return back, Scott Hahn, right? I'm, Rome, I'm sweet there. home. I'm there. You return yeah. back home. Yeah. And, and for us, it was not home at all. But I was in a very difficult spot because now I've given up this Lutheran church. I had already taken a pay cut of about 50% to go and teach at a Catholic seminary. We were barely making ends meet, thanks to the the kindness of our family and a place to live. And now we're saying we can't be Catholic. And there was a continued push, because I was there almost five years at that seminary. In that first year, there was a real heavy push for how quickly can we get you into the Catholic Church? The Archbishop of Detroit would like to ordain you under the Lutheran or, or the Anglican ordinariate. Really? Wow. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I can't. If I was going to serve a Catholic church, it would not be what I'm seeing today, you know? And and just to pause for a second, the parishes that are parishes with the very few married Catholic priests, they're very few. I've only met not, one, I only met yeah. one my whole life. And and they're they're not traditional Latin mass parishes. No. Those parishes reject the married clergy. Yeah. So I knew oh, this is a mess. I'm not going to serve a Catholic parish, but they kept saying. Josh, when are you going to be confirmed? And then they wanted me to sign the oath of fidelity, which every Catholic professor needs to sign if they're going to be teaching Catholic dogma. And I kept, I can't sign it. We're not Catholic, which is why, not to get too far afield, but which is why my degree, my PhD is in systematic theology, dogmatics, but I taught church history because that was their loophole is, well, he's not teaching dogma. So it's okay if he's not Catholic. So I ran a master's program and I taught church history, which was great. I taught church history from the perspective of the Orthodox Church and seminarians who come out of Poland and appreciate Cyril and Methodius loved it. So that was a really that was a really difficult time um, figuring out what we we're going to do. But eventually you can't you can't go nowhere. You have to go someplace. And eventually, you know, I can tell you if you'd like, I can tell you the, what really turned the tide for us was we visited Finally, after all these weeks of agonizing, what are we going to do? I said to my wife, you know, the first two chapters of my dissertation talk all about the Greek tradition and the patristic fathers. Let's go just visit an Orthodox church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we visited um, 
a beautiful OCA church that had hardly anybody there mm. in the heart of Detroit, gated parking lot, you know, mm. it was a rough neighborhood, pull in and there are no cars there. And I'm thinking, oh, geez, this is this, you know, what is happening here? We walk inside and Joseph, the minute we opened the door, the incense hit me. Wow. Now I had served a Lutheran church with incense, but for whatever reason, it was as though I had entered a different world mm. and I wasn't even up the stairs yet. And it wasn't a smells and bells. It wasn't like that. It was, you've stepped foot into the kingdom. It really hit me that way. And I I recognize things in the liter. Oh, there's an epistle reading. There's the gospel reading. Oh, yes, this is. But we didn't know what was going on. And actually, we ended up never going back to that church because we found one closer to our house. But that was really the turning point. We came out to the car after, and I said to my wife, it was dead silent driving home. I finally said, sweetheart, I think, I think we need to be Orthodox. And mm. her initial reaction was, we picked up our whole family, moved to Michigan with the intention of we'll go into the Catholic Church, and now mm. we're going to be Orthodox. Exactly. So it took time. And that was not a challenging part of our marriage, but it caused us to have great communication. <laughs> and we were able to pray together and pray separately and ask for God's guidance and eventually found a priest nearby who providentially had been a Missouri Synod Lutheran minister, just like I was. That's weird. And was able to walk us through, here's how you come truly come home to the Orthodox Church. Was that the first time you'd ever been to an Orthodox Church? It was, absolutely. Wow. Yes. But, but because you were so educated, I mean, you were aware of Orthodoxy as a church. hundred percent, yeah, okay. yeah. And I we're, think I was, I was under maybe the misconception that a lot of our potential converts are today, that Orthodoxy was ethnically you know yeah yeah exactly or it was eastern you know and yeah. and i i grew up in michigan we live in michigan now where some of the ethnic jurisdictions antiochians for example greeks are really heavily middle eastern heavily greek wonderful people but you walk in and you feel like these are not really my people exactly yeah so it was a challenge for us it was a difficult time but God slowly over the course of six or seven months, I mean, we went through catechesis. Um, we did it like everybody else does. And we were oh. received into the Orthodox Church. And I went, I jokingly say, you know, within about two weeks of being received, having known this priest, you know, as a Lutheran, and him having known me, invited me, hey, listen, you better pastor, come start serving in the altar. And I thought this would be great. And I went in on the first Sunday. He said, that's my son. His son was six years old at the time. He said, Joshua, you do whatever my son says. So I had gone from being this Lutheran pastor with my own altar servers and a PhD to listening yeah. to a six-year-old. Oh, well. But it works. It, it works. It, it's the way you come into the church. Yeah, sure. Was this at the OCA parish? No, this was actually an Antiochian parish. Oh, okay. Yes, okay. which happened to be much closer to our house. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm curious too about how long you were churchless because I've met a lot of people like mm. this or gone through this. And I did where yeah. I, I knew that I was leaving the Catholic church, Yeah, but I didn't kind of know where I was going to go. Yeah. So I was kind of just kind of for actually for a while, I was just like, well, I'm going to do church at home. Uh, yes. Yeah. You know, I was mm -hmm. like, I'll just pray or read yeah. or I know a lot of people that are still doing that, that, yeah. that you're just not going to go to a church. You're just going to do it on your own. So how long did you do that? So I would say we were churchless for about a year in yeah. terms of officially belonging to a church. But during that time, I think it was ingrained enough enough ingrained in us enough that I was a Lutheran minister. Yeah. We just went to church. There was, I don't recall a Sunday where we said, we're just going to pray at home. That may have been the Catholic church. We may have gone to a Missouri Synod service wow. in that interim until finding the Orthodox church. Okay. Yeah. So you were just hanging out in different churches. Without... Yeah. Really, really between Lutheran and Catholic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Kind of wondering, God, what did we do? Yeah. That's you know, a hard, that's a hard place to be. And I think what, what pulled me out of it was, was on Sundays because it's like on Sunday, if it's a Catholic, I want to get up, get dressed, yes, put my you know put my suit and tie on, yes. and go to and go to church. That's right. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah, you get, and that's a good routine, right? I mean, when you, when that's so deeply ingrained, you yeah. eventually have to get up and do it. Yeah. And when yeah. I wasn't doing it, it was like, I'm, this is weird. And yeah. And then, uh, and it's kind of funny what you're talking about. Some Western people kind of get turned off or, or aren't attracted to orthodoxy because it seems ethnic. So me being here in San Francisco is like really the only Orthodox church I ever knew. And I, I'd known it for about 30 years is, is of course the one on Geary. Yeah. It's right. the cathedral. But to yeah. me, that was always that was Russian. Russian. And yeah. and even it's less so now, but even the, a lot of the stores and stuff around there are Russian. There's a lot yes, of Russian yeah. stuff there. And I was like, I'm not going there. I'm not Russian. I can't go right. to that church. So, yeah. you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. Yeah. So I went there and of course I met a priest. He spoke English and yeah. everything. And it was like, oh, okay. You know, yeah. and then this is where converts are so important. This is what I want to talk to you too about. Yeah. As I met converts, yeah. people that are American, even a lot of people that aren't even Russian. Like I don't have a yes. drop of Russian blood in me. Yeah. I don't, right, I don't, right. I, I don't know about you, but right. none. No, <laughs> no. Eastern European. So maybe more, cl maybe closer to Russian than you, but yeah, no, I have no none. Russian blood. No, yeah. I have no Eastern European yeah. either. So that, that helps people. Yes. Because they see other converts, it's like, well, number one, I don't have to speak Russian. I have to be yes. Russian in order to be a part of this church. That's right. So, so is that is that is that how kind of happened for exactly you? Exactly I mean, right. Yeah. yeah. So, in fact, I have a very good friend to this day who belongs to a large Antiochian cathedral basilica in this area, and again, we are ten minutes from Dearborn, Michigan. Okay, so is Antiochian, I'm sorry, Father, is Antiochian, yeah. is that, is that Syria? Is that Syrian? Yeah, Damascus. Yes, exactly okay. right. So Anti okay. so there's, there's the Antiochian archdiocese in the okay. United States. Okay. Very, I think across the United States, very convert friendly. Mm -hmm. In the last 30 or 40 years, they've converted, the Lord through them has converted a lot of people. Really? Okay. Lots and lots and lots of people. However, in this area, again, we're, we're 20 minutes from Dearborn, which is a heavily middle eastern muslim population oh so these antiochian parishes in this area tend to be pretty heavy ethnically middle eastern okay and a friend of mine who is himself middle eastern goes to this large antiochian basilica and he said before we ever converted we would love to have you but wow. he said you won't you won't fit in here he said we're we're a clan people and and you're not part of our clan why wouldn't now, you why wouldn't you fit in because you're not you're not, not Middle Eastern. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. And and again, I no fault of their own. That's yeah. the, that's the makeup of the parish. But it really caused us then to say, where are we going to go? Again, providentially, I was teaching at this Catholic seminary, and one of my master students was a priest in the Russian Church. Wow. And I asked him make a recommendation. We we think we want to be Orthodox. We've been going to a small Antiochian parish. That parish was changing. The priest was going to be moved. It may not stay open. The bigger Antiochian church is not a good fit for us. It just ethnically and culturally is a tough fit. He said, try the Russian church. And in a way, it was the best decision we ever made. In part, and I will say this just at a, at a musical liturgical level, coming out of the Protestant church, the ethnic, the, the, the Russian way of singing, for example, is much more familiar to a Protestant. Mm -hmm. Lutherans, for example, have a long history of hymnody, congregational singing, the Russian church, four-part harmony, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of overlap that makes, you know, someone like my wife or my kids who are very familiar with some of the old Anglican Protestant hymnody, mm -hmm. it's not the same thing. I'm not suggesting that. But the way of singing was very familiar to them, as opposed to a more Byzantine way with isons and the way it sounds, it's very, it's very much a different sound. So that for us coming into a Russian church that was really all English speaking was a very natural transition for us. But, no, no, were the, I'm confused. Were the, were the, was the liturgy in Slavonic? Liturgy was all in English. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So the Russian church that I serve now, this is actually the church okay. we came to kind of very quickly after our conversion uh, is a, is a parish of the Moscow Patriarchate. Okay. So not to get too far in the weeds, but it's this small group of parishes 
that when the OCA was formed in 1970, stayed under Moscow. Okay. Oh, yeah. So now, now we're reunited with Rocor as of okay. 2007. Oh, awesome! But our our bishop is the patriarch of Moscow himself. So he has these 38 or 39 parishes in America. Is, is that Kirill? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay. So he these are his parishes. They're called wow. the patriarchal parishes. Wow, that's cool. And we ha we have a vicar bishop, Bishop Matthew, who lives in London. Actually, he's wow. an interim bishop. But with all the politics of America and Russia, getting a permanent bishop appointed is almost impossible right now. Wow. So, I mean, even getting a visa is almost impossible for these guys. But we are a parish that is the, the ecclesial possession of the Patriarch of Moscow. What's beautiful about that, though, is um, right now our parish is, we do have Russian families, but all English speaking, the liturgy is predominantly in English. Uh, we do the Our Father, the kids choir sings the Our Father in Slavonic. A few of the litanies are in Slavonic, but anybody who's there knows what's going on. Uh, and right now our parish is about, uh, not exaggerating, about 98 or 99 percent converts. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Well, God, you know, <laughs> COVID has done a wonderful thing for our churches. Uh, and and in this respect, our church being able to stay open through COVID, we are one of only two or three. Oh, why? Of, 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 you asked why? Yeah. We were able to stay open because the governor of Michigan essentially said, we're asking all churches to close down, but we're not going to fine you or punish you if you don't. And so we said, okay, thank you very much. We won't close down. Was that Whitmer? Yeah, exactly. Oh, she had such a bad reputation. She did. She still, well, she does among some. I mean, and she's a liberal. She's, I guess she's a liberal Democrat. Yeah, she is. Yeah. She's the one I think who's kind of vying now for the presidency. Correct. If, if President Biden steps down or doesn't run again. But this, this is one beautiful thing she did do, which is she, she said, I, you know, if you're a, if you're a wow. Jewish man or woman going to synagogue, we want you to shut down, but we won't punish you. Really? Those wow. Have this, in this area. I think, I'm not exaggerating, I think every denomination Closed. shut down their churches, except for us, our parish, a local Rokor monastery, <laughs> and a Rokor church on the other side of the, I'm sorry, an, a Moscow Patriarchate church on the other side of the state. That's cool. We didn't have, we didn't require masks, we didn't require social wow. distancing, we didn't look for vaccine cards, we didn't change our practices, we just <laughs> said, we're going to be the church. Wow. And when you had other other that was a, that was a smart move. Well, in hindsight, in hindsight, and and if I can make a little tangent, it was it was really the work of Saint John the Wonder Worker of Shanghai and San Francisco. You know, we received his relic literally as Los Angeles was shutting down. At the time, our deacon flew to San Francisco. We had been promised by the late Metropolitan Hilarion of Rocor a relic of Saint John. Wow. And we had had all these dates planned. We were going to, you know, you have to go get the relic. They're not going to send it to you by mail. You go pick it up. Trip got canceled. Flight got changed. Finally, and I'm getting frustrated, right? Because I think this is important. We need to do this now. Eventually, we get this all arranged. And our deacon is going to fly to San Francisco and pick up the relic. Mm. He flies to San Francisco. As he's flying out of LAX, Los Angeles airport shuts down. Wow. And he has St. John on his chest in a reliquary. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> he comes back. We bring St. John in. And beginning that Sunday, and it's been now almost four and a half years, beginning that Sunday, and we do it to this day, at every Sunday liturgy, I take his relic in his icon, and the entire parish processes around our temple. That's special. Somebody asked me, why are you going to, when are you going to stop? I said, well, what happened when St. John left? the island of Tubabao in the Philippines. He would go out every night. He'd bless all four directions with an icon. Wow. No typhoon. They leave the island. A typhoon decimates the island. So I said, so long as I'm the priest here, every Sunday we will process with St. John's relics. So St. John is really the one who protected us. St. John is the one who interceded for us. St. John is the reason we stayed open. And and I will say, you know, the sad thing is there are almost 40 churches in Detroit, including in Detroit and Metro Detroit area, Orthodox churches, mm. Metro Detroit. We're one of them. When only one of those stays open, 
what are people going to do? I mean, Go essentially, there. yeah, essentially, essentially some clergy were for all intents and purposes defrocked for six weeks. You know, the bishop said you can't serve liturgy. I know. Well, you know, if that's if this is the life giving body and blood of Christ, we're going to stay open. And and we were fortunate. We had a governor again who was maybe more liberal, but in this instance was at least permiss permissible about these things. And and God, I think, for faithfulness and the presence of Saint John and other saints, uh, God has very much blessed us with just really faithful people who want nothing more than to be united to Christ. Because the, the it's kind of funny because COVID kind of delayed my conversion because the lockdown was hard in san francisco yes, yes. so in, in 2018 i really got fed up with the catholic church that was a bad year for mm. catholicism and i had i was back in pennsylvania doing something catholic and then as an aside in philly and then as an aside i went up to saint t combs oh yeah in north yeah. northeastern pennsylvania yeah and i stayed there for about three days on a little retreat and the the i guess you call them monks the monks yeah. were so kind to me. And when I got back, I had visited the cathedral in San Francisco. I decided to become Orthodox. And that was, that was 2018. And then, but then in 2019, yeah, everything yeah. locked down real hard here. So I was away for a while. Yeah. And, and it wasn't until 2022 that, oh, right. that I was baptized, but. That's fine. Yeah. All, all, in, all in God's you all know. in God's time. Exactly. And, and it was our, you know, for people that had to be away. And there were situations where they had to. They had no option. That's its own time of of trying and testing and you know, sharpening and beautifying in all of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Although in the in San Francisco the the lockdown was hard in the outline areas, I think the priests yeah. sort of got inventive on what they could they did yeah. they kind of figured out how to get around things yeah. so although it was kind of rough here because i think people were snitching on each other you know yes. well that, that that church is open and yeah it was quite terrible i know? think the one advantage california has is the weather is a little bit easier to in the winter time to be outside right true, and to true. do things like that yeah true yeah. you can you can yeah no no um was there like a particular, well, you mentioned St. John mm. uh, uh, of Shanghai and San Francisco, uh, San Francisco and Shanghai. And uh, somebody, a, a saint that was real, I'd say instrumental in me coming into orthodoxy mm -hmm. was St. Seraphim Rose. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Fa That's a, Father you and I are of the same opinion. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Now, was there like a particular like saint or maybe it just wasn't one? But was there yeah. somebody that like really like touched you in orthodoxy that yeah that became not I don't know if you call it your patron or somebody yeah. that that's you know, like your patron saint? Hmm. Well, not it's funny. I've grown to really appreciate and love certain holy men and women far mm. more having been orthodox now. Mm. I, I there was not the kind of situation where I said, "Wow, that one person really speaks to me." I would say if if I was pressed and somebody said, who were the influential people? I would say St. John Chrysostom was one mm -hmm. of them. Having yeah. read his homilies, having read his On the Priesthood. Yeah, I, yes. I have, I have his icon here. Oh, yes. Beautiful. It's and and for, me saying, for me saying, wow, he writes all this about the priesthood. I want to share in that. You know, that was part of me leaving Lutheranism was to say, this is the priesthood. And I would say also, you know, someone that was very dear to me, partly because of having studied at St. Andrews, was the Apostle Andrew. I really had this, this, this ongoing thought in my head of the first called, you know, that in my family, you know, kind of being the first called to orthodoxy. And, and God willing, seeing myself as someone who can be an example and a witness to other family members that don't know Christ in this way. So those two really... I know those are far more ancient than Seraphim Rome, or Seraphim Rose and yeah. St. John the Wonder Worker. Kind of providentially, though, um, I was ordained a Lutheran minister. This is back in 2006 mm -hmm. on November 26th. Okay, now that date might, oh, great, November 26th, that's fine. That's also the feast of St. Innocent of Yerkutsk, which is the parish I now serve as an Orthodox mm -hmm. priest. 
So I see now St. Innocent, for example, whose icon is right up here. I see him as, among others, really a patron for my priesthood. He was an evangelistic kind of missionary bishop. Was he in Alaska? Alaska? No, he was no. in Mongolia. Oh, Mongolia. He was sent all out in Siberia. Wow. Um, he was an educator. He died young, basically, from being overworked. But oh, I no. see his his evangelistic efforts to build up Orthodox schools, to preach the gospel as really, you know, a, a, a key influence in my own priesthood. And it, it's not by, there's nothing by accident. There's nothing by coincidence. The fact that I was ordained a Lutheran minister on his feast and now serve his church, his parish, uh, I think is makes him someone who's very influential to me. But I have grown to love over the years, Father Seraphim Rose, quite a lot. When I first became Orthodox, I heard what everybody else heard, which is, oh, he's extreme, he's this, he's that. You know, I'll be honest, anybody who's a true believer today is going to be extreme. True. I mean, that's just Christianity, because the world yeah. is so upside down. So he and 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 St. John the Wonder Worker, St. Luke of Crimea, you know, these men are are really strong influences on my own priesthood. Wow. Now, now I wanted to I had you almost an hour. I wanted to talk to you about converts to, yeah, to yeah. orthodoxy, and you're the the right person to talk about. When I was preparing to to speak with you, I did some research, and I thought, well, let me look for some articles hmm. online about that people have written about maybe recent converts to orthodoxy i found some articles that were good some were quite uncharitable and mm -hmm. i thought i'm not going to ask father about these because then it just gives those people more airtime yeah but it, it's i guess it it's a bit controversial within orthodoxy about so many converts mm -hmm. because i guess there it there hasn't been and catholicism has, I don't know about a steady stream, but Catholicism has always had a pretty regular yeah. influx mm -hmm. of, of converts. I mean, yeah. I was Catholic for 20 years, and there were always people coming into the church. Maybe sometimes it was, I have to say a lot of times it was because they were marrying a Catholic. Absolutely. But a lot of times it was, yeah, people come in from other religions. Like, um, mm -hmm. I never met anybody that came from Orthodoxy, but a lot of people that were coming from, yeah, Protestant Yes, yes. religions and stuff were kind of were, were fed up with that and and my experience was that the con the converts were more much more fervent mm. much more knowledgeable mm -hmm. than the the longtime catholics or the or the people who were born catholic yes absolutely yeah so and i was saying i'm not saying anything bad about orthodox but in the orthodox church i, I found that true the the yeah. orthodox converts me aside but the orthodox converts are are very fervent for the yes. faith 100%. you know yes and they read a lot and they yes. study a lot and they're very into it and there's a different <laughs> piety there's really a different piety i mean yeah. i think again people have probably documented this but i think there's a whole generation of Orthodox Christians who are now in their probably 60s and 70s, mm. who grew up, quote unquote, in the church. They were baptized in the church. Mm. But I think their parents who have now died off or just died off or dying off, for them, I can't say it any other way than, you know, they, they lived in the world and they went to church. Yeah. I think now the reality is we live in the church and we go to the world. Yeah. And, and I say that all the time to my parishioners, the world, we can, we do not live in the world, we go to the world. Yeah. But I think for that previous generation, they lived in the world and yeah. church was a, you know, we do it, we go to the feast, you know, we go to Christmas, we go to Easter, we go on Sunday. But when that's it, when it doesn't spill over into your life, you, people are not going to remain Orthodox. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, at our parish now, like I said, about 90, I, I got one parishioner who was baptized, I mean, adults. We have a lot of babies who have been baptized Orthodox, but adults, one parishioner out of 60 adults that was baptized, born and raised Orthodox, all of his counterparts at that demographic who used to go to church, don't go to church. 
Sunday morning is for football games, for staying out late Saturday night, for whatever it might be. Oh, it is now the converts who are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And on a Sunday, if we're blessed with, you know, when I when I came to the parish I'm at now, we get 20 people on a Sunday, much older demographic, COVID hit, they all stop going to church, they don't come back. Yeah. Now we might have, you know, on, on good Sundays, there might be 80 people. That's I mean, four, four times. But these, a majority of them are people with young children under the age of 12 yeah. who say, this is life for us. Oh. So I think that's the difference is you're right. There is a different fervor, a different awareness of theological, you know, uh, reality. Sometimes and I think it's because it's new. I when, think yes. Whenever you're introduced to something new, you get yes. real excited about it. Yes. And that's the key. I think with our converts is the first year is great. You know, everybody thinks this is wonderful. My first yeah. Lent, my first Pascha. And then you're in your third or fourth Lent and you're trying to figure out how to fast and how to pray. And suddenly that's where I, I joke, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not I, I know. Yet. Yeah. From my own experience though, and this is kind of to the question about converts, I think one thing we have not done well in America in orthodoxy is just the whole process of catechesis. For a lot of people, I hear at least, a lot of people, they can walk into an Orthodox church, first time ever, two weeks later, they're made a catechumen. Oh, yeah, they many. have a couple conversations with their priest, and eight weeks or two or three, four months later, they're baptized, chrismated, whatever they do in that church. That's how they're brought in. And invariably, then within five or six months, they're saying, wait, this didn't change my life the way I thought it would. What do I do? So I have found, you know, here locally, every instance where someone has fallen away from the Orthodox Church to a person, it was somebody that I brought into the church before at least about a year or a year and a half. So for, you know, for here, at least, the rule is no one's a catechumen before six months, just a catechumen. Mm. We'll make you a catechumen around six months. But the expectation is you're coming to vigil. You're already starting to to live the Christian life, you're praying at home, you're giving, you know, finance where your treasure is there, your heart is, you're coming to Sunday liturgy. And then if you do that and you go through catechesis, which lasts about a year, then we'll talk about bringing you into the church. Because mm -hmm. I think people, part of the reason they fall away is it's the parable of the sower, right? They shoot up very quickly, but oh, there are yeah. no roots. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was blessed at my parish because um, I don't know if my parish is unique, but uh, is blessing because it's, there's a mixture. There's, there's American converts, yeah. but then, I mean, there's some old time Russians that are still there too, yes. but then there's also the children of some of the Russians who are, mm -hmm. who are kind of my age or a little older yeah. and they've really, although they were raised with the faith and it's, yeah. it's certainly not new for them and they're very knowledgeable, but they've stuck with it. Thank God. Yeah. So they're good examples. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And some of us, like our parish, we're trying to raise up that generation who will be an example to the next. Yeah. 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 We'll take, well, it's going to take time. Absolutely. But, but so I've been, I've been blessed that way that I mean, I have a very good God, Godfather, yeah. Godmother. And I think what, what I've noticed too in Orthodoxy is that it's so different from Roman Catholicism, even when I was Catholic, I was a traditional Catholic, so I went to a traditional yeah. um, Latin Mass parish, which is usually much smaller than your typical yeah. Catholic uh, church parish or church, and people know each other much more. But the thing that kind of I, it was kind of it was very disconcerting the first time I went to Orthodox Church was how like friendly everybody is right. because. I, you know, I was at a traditional Latin mass for 20 years mm. and I, I, you know, I knew some people well, yeah. but I wouldn't say I was like friends with them. Right, they were just right, sort right. of like church people that I knew and they were good people. And we didn't really like hang out much yeah. after church people. You just kind of went into church mm the the tlm is about maybe an hour and a half yeah. and then a lot of people just leave yes because right. they have a lot of kids or whatever they've got they've got stuff to do and yeah. not a lot of people hung out yeah. so the weird thing about orthodoxy was that people stayed 
after Absolutely. church. People, everybody knows each other, right? Usually by by name, mm -hmm. and it's a very much like a big family. And it was yeah. funny because like my godmother, it's like, oh, you're part of our family now. That's right. that's right. it. That was very, that was kind of hard for me to get used to because yeah. that's not what Catholic church was yeah. like. So that yeah. that's a big part, I think, of orthodoxy too for that's converts true. is that you're not just like coming into a, just a church, but you're coming into this big family. A hundred percent. And and most <laughs> people, you know this from just talking to people, most people, what are their two greatest struggles? I feel alone and I feel yeah. unloved. Yeah, True. And orthodoxy answers those questions. Oh, they will bring you in. Let me tell you. A absolutely. And so, yeah, I think, you know, again, from my own experience here, that familial aspect is everything. Yeah. It's everything. If you can go to church, receive the mysteries, go to the parish hall and have a meal together and laugh together and cry yeah. together. Yeah. And, and like you said, that is so foreign to the world. Yeah. You know, so this is the place where all of those desires that are deep seated in the image God has given us, where all those desires are made full and made complete. And yeah, I mean, a parish will transform if they have a, a, a familial life after liturgy that is as rich as it is in the liturgy. You do that, the parish will be transformed. It is. And I have to say, Orthodox, I don't know if this is a particularly Russian flavor, but they love converts. I oh, mean, if, if you show up. Yes. And because when I first started showing up, I was like, I wanted to be like real low key, yeah, you know, right, just, right. just, and that didn't last long. So, I mean, I just, you know, hung out in the back, just, I'm yep. just like, I'm going to be very quiet. Yeah. And did, like I said, it didn't last because yeah. people are like, oh, you know, hello, how are you? Who are you? Oh, you're interested yes. in Orthodox. Oh my God. You yes, know, yeah. so yeah. it's like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And there is that fine line, right? You've experienced this between like chasing somebody down. You know, we had no. that experience once we were coming yeah. into, we visited an Orthodox yeah. church before we converted. There were not many people. And this was not the first experience at an Orthodox church, different one, but we left and they like came out to the parking lot. Oh, stay for lunch. And I'm thinking oh, yeah, good. Uh, that that's good, but yeah. I didn't think you'd come all the way out to the parking lot. So of there course. is that fine line, but no, we've got to be, you know, listen, everybody's part of the family. This is the, yeah. the Orthodox church should be where everyone's in and no one's out. I agree. And yeah. I never felt pressured at all. No, no. No, I didn't. I just I just kind of went at my own pace. And the priest was very good too. I just because yeah. he knew I was coming with a lot of baggage yeah. from Roman Catholicism. So he just let me go at my own pace. And but I think the port the important thing that you said is that you got to show up. And that was one of the things that father said because I think in the beginning when I kind of had one foot in orthodoxy and one foot in Catholicism. And I couldn't, I was torn. He just said, Joe, you got to be here. You got to show Absolutely. up. And and then I did. And he knew yeah. it because I was yeah. there every Sunday, day in and day out. That's right. And I think that's, you know, people often ask me, I just had a conversation with someone last Saturday. He showed up early with his mom. He's a young, you know, oh, teenage good. kid. And he said, what do I need to do to become orthodox? Yeah. He'd never been to a service before. And, and I say what I say to everybody, you can go out and read and listen to a lot of good stuff. You can go out and read and listen to a lot of bad stuff. Yeah. But at the end of the day, what will make you orthodox is come to the services. Because at the end of the day, if you become orthodox, that's the expectation, isn't it? I think it's St. John of the Ladder who says, you know, the, the surest sign of the deadening of the soul is the avoidance of church services. Mm -hmm. So the minute that happens, something's happening in your soul. So I say to them, you want to be Orthodox? Here's how you learn. Come to the Divine Liturgy. Come to Vigil. You know, come. That's, that's, I mean, that's, and I think, you know, I didn't know what you and I would talk about today, but I think one thing that's always been on my heart in terms of converts is we just need to be authentic. We need to be real. We need to be honest about the state of the world, about the state of the demonic, about what Christ is doing in the church. And at the end of the day, you know, the church is for everyone. But not everyone wants the church. But I think compromise and boy, that that will be the death of us. We need yeah. to be authentic. We need to improve our preaching. We've got to improve how we serve the liturgy. And we need to be willing to tell people, this is the truth. This is the truth. The, the, and you said it earlier, and you said it in your article too, is the continuity in, in 
Orthodox liturgy. One thing that was tough in Catholicism, especially if, if you go to the, the new mass, mm -hmm. you, I mean, depending on the priest, you, you're like never sure what's going to pop out of the box. But even at the traditional Latin mass, it's kind of like, well, father's late for a plane because he sped yeah. through it so yeah. fast. You know, and so that was kind of hit and miss too. But I have to say that, and this was kind of hard to get used to too. In orthodoxy, yeah, there's a real continuity in in the liturgy. I tell, I, I always retell this funny story at our parish, you know, because you have the iconostasis. Sometimes yeah, yeah. you're not too sure who's back there. Yeah. So until later, you know, until the the royal mm -hmm. doors open. But I remember one time, father, our our pastor was you know, he was away and I thought it was a little different, but it was, you know, it's just a very, the continuity of the mass yeah. and it was a different priest, oh, but yeah. it's still, it was very much the same. And that's I think funny. that's good. That's no disregard for the priest, but I think if the priest kind of disappears, okay. that's good because in Roman Catholicism, the liturgy was so pre-centered. Especially and in the TLM. Oh my gosh, yeah. it is. It's because even their priests have different ways of doing things. Yes. It can be like radically different, Absolutely. but that's not an orthodox. You guys really have to all row at the same speed and, and do everything. Yeah. It's about <laughs> Christ. It's all about Christ. I mean, literally we say at our parish, Christ first, yeah. you know, it's all about Christ. It's not about me. It's yeah. about Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, at your parish, the converts, where where are they coming from? Like what religion yeah. are they coming from? I would say in, in recent years, in the last five years, a majority have come from the Catholic Church. Wow. And I would say maybe equal to that were people that may have been Catholic, raised Catholic, but fell into the occult, fell into new age practices. Wow. I was just talking to someone the other day and I said, you know, my catechesis has changed in the last five years because it used to be you had a common set of vocabulary words, right? Everybody yeah. knew baptism. Everybody yeah. knew Eucharist. Now, we may have different understandings, but we're working with fairly similar definitions. Now, I have catechumens that you say baptism. They don't know what that is. So, so they haven't been baptized. Haven't been baptized or just have, they've not been in the church in any denomination for decades. And so they're, you know, they're caught up in yoga and honestly, you know, this uh, hallucinogenic drug use, yeah, yeah. you know, all these kinds of things where you have to unpack a different set of, of burdens and struggles and speak in a different way. Wow. Even in Michigan, there's oh, that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, Detroit is, is a melting pot in some respects and there's okay. a large art community, music community there. Okay. And I think that, that attracts some of that, especially among young people. Okay. What yeah. would the, the everybody's different but what are draw what draws these people t to orthodoxy yeah i would say they would probably describe it as the the historicity you know there's something stable there oh, yeah. they're just looking for a lot of them just say i googled what's the oldest church in the world really you know, and, and they came up orthodox church and so <laughs> that that's how they kind of get started i think though you know, what draws them to the Russian church? Because I think that is a unique draw for some people. Yeah, it was for me. What draws them to the Russian church is really, in a positive way, the spiritual discipline of the Russian church. Mm -hmm. I had a, I have a friend who's a deacon, and he said to me the very first time he ever visited the Russian church, he said, Father, orthodoxy is like the military. The Russian church is like the Navy SEALs. Wow. You know, there's sort of a, not rigidity, but there's a real... Even in how we serve, there's a real discipline, how we move. I agree. It, yeah. And so I think people see that and their lives are so chaotic that they want something that is ordered. And I tell people all the time, what's the first thing God does in Genesis? He orders the chaos. Mm -hmm. And so the Russian church, I think, is in a very unique spot to be an extra dose of order in the chaos of the world. So for us, the fact that it's English speaking Russian spirituality under the patriarch of Moscow, you know, no divergence. We're serving the services as they're given to us as best as we're able. Of course, we're serving the services. We're not skipping things. People say, wow, 
if I'm going to be orthodox, I want that. Wow. Wow. That yeah. I would have to say the stability and yeah, the orderliness of the Orthodox Church is, yeah, because even in Catholicism, it was liturgically, it's all over. And, yes. and unfortunately, theologically, it's all over the place. Back to where we started, Lex Arande, Lex Credendi, right? Yeah. The way you pray affects the way you believe. And then what people end up doing is you get into these little conclaves. Absolutely. Like you'll find a little traditional, uh, uh, like oasis. But the yes. thing that always worried me about this, and it always came true, is that it often hinged on the priest sometimes. Yeah. And then what happens if something happens to the priest? Yeah, but yeah. then it, it also, it hinged on the bishop. So if the bishop either moves his priest or doesn't want that, that little traditional group there anymore, yes. what do you do? And you can have the, the, you can have the rug pulled out from, from under. Exactly. And you become at some point, Joseph, you become your own, not just your own small C church, your yeah. own big C church, yeah. your own, do not, you become your own God. That yeah. was how I felt in Lutheranism. At some point we are on such an island we are our own deity right now yeah. and that's a scary place to be yeah because when i mean i'm i'm less paranoid now but when i came to orthodoxy i was kind of like well what happens if you know a priest wants to do this yeah or a bishop wants to do this mm -hmm. or they want to do this and and see orthodox they come from a totally different mindset and they look at me and go well they can't do that they can't do that right exactly yeah the, 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 the bumpers on the lane are very strong, right? You can't, there's not a lot of divergence. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, that's hard. That's been hard for me to get over because I still mm -hmm. think like something's going to jump out at you. But yeah. in orthodoxy, just you just, you, uh, a priest can't like innovate. Right, right. Like show up one day and say, you know, I'm going to tweak the liturgy a little bit. You know, and 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 it's funny because the Orthodox people say, "Well, no, the people in or in Orthodox are like they know they will, revolt. and they would yes. pick it up right away." Yes. Well, what's Father up to? Yes, which is interesting yes. because in Catholicism, it's kind of like, oh, okay, you know. Yeah. Well, again, I think I think you <laughs> said it in your recent article where there's almost this priest worship in Catholicism. Yeah. They wouldn't call it that, but that's it's that's true. the reality. Yeah, where the priest. Can do no wrong listen i'm in obedience to the bishop this yeah. is the bishop's parish which means it's god's parish yeah so everything is about obedience falling in line and i simply you know it's like the centurion in this some this sunday's coming gospel i'm a man in authority and a man under authority mm -hmm. you know so i only do what's been given to me to do and the church makes it very clear here are the ways you are a church you serve mm -hmm. like this you live like this and my job is not to impose that on anyone my job is simply to say this is the life of the church now in catholicism they have a, a big problem with vocations to the priesthood mm. how how is how are things going in 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 orthodoxy and in particularly you know where are you how, how are vocations well i i don't think it's i don't think we're in a good spot Ooh. there was a there was a presentation maybe six or seven weeks ago I forget, it was an Orthodox kind of research foundation that did a presentation. And I'm I'm going to get the numbers wrong, but it was something like in five years, there will be a hundred parishes in America that need priests or something like that. The number was very high percentage wise. Is that so because we, Orthodoxy is growing? I think it's, well, that could be part of it. I also think right. that the average age of our clergy we don't see that necessarily in, in, in some of the Russian parishes, but I think across the board, the average age is quite old, okay. 60, 70, 80, Ooh. near retirement, you know, near a health scare where that's not going to be able to serve. So I think we're in a tough spot. I think the key will be, how are we going to prepare men to go and be servants of God in the Holy Church? So one view is it's only by going to seminary. I think there's another extreme that says, Oh, seminary doesn't really matter. As long as you're a faithful Orthodox Christian, you can be a priest. Well, obviously, I value seminary, having been to seminary, having taught in seminary. I think the answer is someplace in the middle. I think we need to get creative with how we train men to be priests and deacons. Um, I don't think we can just say, oh, geez, you come to church. That makes you fit to be a priest or a deacon. That's the start, <laughs> but that's not the end, right? That's the, that's the expectation. You're going to come to church. But even the apostles, 
were with the Lord for three years. You okay, know, yeah. they followed him. They learned from him. So I think we need we need some kind of plan or program in place that will allow men to get the training they need without uprooting their families and moving to Jordanville or New York yeah. or wherever it might be. So we're in a tough spot. Um, is it as bad as Catholicism? I don't know. I know Catholicism. Yeah. I'm certain that's part of the reason they've merged so many parishes. You know, they oh, just yeah, don't have yeah. priests to serve them. No, no, no. Um, but we need we desperately need more deacons. You know, we need, we should not have parishes where it's just a priest. That's what I have now. I'm just a, I'm one priest in a parish with no other servers. I have kids who are serving, but no other deacons or anything like that. that can you, can you, can you, um, I don't know how you say it, recruit? Could you recruit somebody from your parish to that, say? That's what I'm actively trying to do. Exactly. Like, okay. Hey, you know, you should, let's, let's ask God if this might be good for you. You know, let's, let's. Let's talk about what your future might look like in terms of serving the church. But of course, you know, the requirements are not minimal. We expect you to, you know, manage your family well, not be given to drunkenness, not, you know, all the, so there, are, that doesn't mean that I have people in my parish like that. What I'm saying is just because you're, like I say, of altar service, just because you're a man doesn't mean you're allowed to serve in the altar. Right. You know, so we do, we need to be actively recruiting. We need, you know, we need priests that are, well-trained themselves that can begin the process of training men. And it can't just be, you know, my grandpa who was a priest taught me to do it this way. So I'm going to teach you to do it this way. It's got to be, here are the reasons we do these things. I want you to go read this. I want to talk about this. We need well-educated clergy who can begin the process of cultivating education, or at least the desire to be educated in young men or so, older men. Yeah. yeah. So will the next generation of, of, I mean, in the Russian Orthodox Church, will the next generation of priests be mainly converts like you? I think so. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah, okay. I I have a feeling. I'm thinking about the parishes in the Moscow Patriarchate in America. So they're you know about forty, let's say. Wow. Um, I would say that in those parishes, you know, within the next twenty years, most of those clergy will be converts. You have a few enclaves on the East Coast where they've been born and raised Orthodox for years, but. You get where I am in the Midwest, um, down south. You know, we've got a parish in Alabama. You go down there, they're all going to be converts. And thank mm. God. I mean, I, I think you, you, we've talked a lot about Catholicism and the nature of it in America. But mm. someone once described orthodoxy today in America a little bit like Catholicism was here 200 or 300 years ago. What I mean by that is ethnically heavy, but slowly becoming a melting pot. You know, 200 years ago, there that's the Irish church, that's the German church, that's the Polish church. Italian. Now, yeah. yeah, now they're all together. You get small spots where it's not like that, but for the most part, they're all together. That will be orthodoxy. You know, yeah, there'll be a Greek church or like ours, a Russian church, but they all speak English. They all serve yeah. in English. And I think that that fact alone will be attractive to people that are saying, I'm at least going to go explore orthodoxy. In 20 or 30 years, most of our clergy then will probably be converts. Wow, wow. Now, yeah, the other the other thing that's hard to get used to coming from Catholicism is the married priesthood. Yeah. yeah. You know, the priest has a wife and, oh, there's the father's kids and yeah. sometimes his grandkids. That's, yeah. kind, that's kind of hard to get used to, but, but you know, it's it's new. Well, mm -hmm. I, I kept you too long. What, what what this is a big big question but what would you say i know what i'd say to them but what would you say to people that are feeling kind of wayward right now mm. or homeless or churchless and they kind of don't yeah. know what to do you know because i know a lot of people who you know for lack of a better word you know phrase or something are just trying to make the best of it where they are mm -hmm. there it's it's kind of sad because well i was this way for a long time too for i would have to say and i'm not exaggerating for most of the 20 years in catholicism i wasn't that happy yeah but mm -hmm. but i stuck with it but i know a lot of people and they're not all just catholic but i know a lot of people that are in their church some of them were born in the church mm -hmm. but some of them been there a long time and but they're not happy Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and it's kind of a it's a bummer way to be yeah. because at least on sunday you should have a respite from yeah. the horrible you right. know world but they they just they're not content there either mm -hmm. so what would you say they could do i i would say hey give it a try what do you got to lose 
Absolutely. I my and I might I might even be a little stronger. I would say stop putting up with mediocre. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, if if every Sunday you say, oh, geez, then I'm Catholic or I'm Lutheran or I'm Baptist, or there's got to be something else out there. And I'm reminded over and over of the men who come to Philip in John's gospel and say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Mm-hmm. That's what a lot of these people are asking. We want to see Jesus. Yeah. People are in a, a rut too. They yeah. get in a rut. And so, and and then I would also say what said in the gospels, come and see. You just have to come. And and I almost to a person, this is not true across the board, but almost to a person, if you come to a divine liturgy, you will walk away changed. So, not to entirely, it takes a long time, but you will sense there, as almost everyone says to me when they come visit a liturgy, wow, I I could I could feel that God was here. And I would say to many of these people who, who are in a rut, it's because they go to church and God is not there mm. in the way that he is in orthodoxy. We want to see Jesus. Yeah. yeah, just come. Just it's come. it's scary, Father, too. But I mean, you're a good example of this because I mean, you were invested in Lutheranism. Yeah. I mean, you were all in. So all in. it yep. it's scary for people to like make a change like that. That's it is. That's you know, and tough. It, and I think this is part of. I think sometimes people maybe think, at least in my own parish, maybe think, well, boy, he talks so openly about, you know, why do you care about all these things? Partly because I gave them all up. You know, I. I gave up retirement. I gave up a house. I gave up a salary. But I take very seriously the words of Jesus. You know, don't put your hand to the plow and look back. Mm -hmm. You know, if you love father and mother more than me, you have no place in the kingdom. I don't think Jesus is being facetious. I think he's being serious. And if, if, if you are looking for the kingdom of God and you're not finding that, then you have to look someplace else. And, and almost to a person, the place they have not looked is the Orthodox church. So come and see, just come and see. And I think then for, for my brother priests and deacons and faithful lay people like you who are converts in parishes, be authentic. You know, we have to up our, we cannot blow smoke. We can't do, be authentic. Priests, write a homily, deliver it well, serve the liturgy well. There's this line they tell priests when you're about to be ordained. They say, often they'll say, serve every liturgy like it's your last. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful line. I That's like nice. to think of, serve every liturgy like it's your first. You know why? Because mm. I was so prepared to serve liturgy my first time, mm. right? We need to be prepared. We need to be ready to answer the questions that come to us. We need to be hospitable. We need to be a family like you described. And if people come and they experience that, I promise you they will they will come back. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So just come and see. Yeah. Thank you, Father, for spending thank so you. much time Thank you. God bless you. Yes, thank you. Could, could you offer a little, I always ask priests, at the end, could you offer a little prayer for me sure. and anybody listening? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master, lover of mankind, with the pure light of your divine wisdom. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of your gospel teachings. Implant also in us the fear of your blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal pleasures and lusts, we may enter upon a spiritual way of living. For blessed and most glorified is your all holy name. And unto you do we send up glory with your Father, who was without beginning, and your most holy and good and life-giving spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Thank you, Father. God bless you. You're welcome. You. I'll put the link to Father's Parish in the the notes for this, uh, the, the description for this. Perfect video. Thank God you. bless you, Joseph. Thank Thanks, you so bye. much. Chat again soon. Okay. Thank you. Take care.